Death speaks. There was a merchant in Baghdad who sent his servant to market to buy provisions, and in a little while the servant came back, white and trembling, and said, Master, just now, when I was in the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd, and when I turned, I saw it was death that jostled me. She looked at me and made a threatening gesture. Now, lend me your horse, and I will ride away from this city and avoid my fate. I will go to Samara, and there death will not find me. The merchant lent him his horse, and the servant mounted it. And he dug his spurs in its flanks, and as fast as the horse could gallop he went. Then the merchant went down to the marketplace, and he saw me standing in the crowd. And he came to me and said, Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant when you saw him this morning? That was not a threatening gesture, I said. It was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad, for I had an appointment with him tonight in Samara. That is from the Epigraph uh, by W. Somerset Maugham that John O'Hara uses to start his debut novel, Appointment in Samara. This was John O'Hara's first novel. Uh, John O'Hara, who was born in 1905, died in 1970. He wrote a bunch of stories, a bunch of stories for The New Yorker. And they're dynamite, too. Uh, he wrote good stories, John O'Hara. So it should be no surprise that his first novel was so good. And this is a really, really good debut novel. Debut or not, it's just an excellent novel. Uh, one of the best novels I've read. And I've read a few of them. This is excellent. There are some people who believe that this is his best novel. I could see why you might think that, because it is so good. I don't know that it is, though. Uh, he's got some challenges there. This one was published in 1934. Uh, John O'Hara is sometimes compared to F. Scott Fitzgerald. I'm not really sure why. They seem to me to be very different writers. He came uh, a bit later. He was of the generation that was financially unprepared for the Great Depression. And this book is about a fellow named Julian English, who is a car dealer in Pennsylvania. It was Gibbsville, Pennsylvania. And Julian English is pretty successful. He's really well off, this guy. He's married, has a good, good uh, relationship with his wife for the most part, even though he kind of likes to cheat a little bit, this guy. He's no angel, Julian English, as we shall see. But he lives a pretty good life. He, things are going his way, Julian English. So it's a little bit of a surprise to see him completely demolish his own life, which is what this book is about. It's fascinating uh, what happens in this book and the depth of this book. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. It's a pretty realistic book. It, it was sexually very frank. It was very frank in its depictions of sexuality. And it was kind of shocking in its day. Now, of course, it's no big deal. But the whole thing has a, a bit of a sense of realism to it, uh, which makes it a, even more involving. Julian English is an interesting character, that's for sure. So this guy, like I said, he had it made. Everything's going great with this guy. And then there's one day where he ends up throwing a drink in a guy's face. Now this guy was really a no English Julian English didn't like this guy at all. But this guy that he throws the drink in this guy's face 
uh, happens to be an investor in his business. Julian English owes this guy money. So as annoying as this guy was to Julian English, he knew that to follow his impulse, and his impulse was to just toss a drink in this guy's face, to follow this impulse would be disastrous. And it describes this in this part of the book where he, he has this impulse to do it. And you think he didn't do it, but then later, later on, the book does an interesting thing where you find out that Julian English did, in fact, throw a drink into this guy's face when you have two other characters talking about this shocking event. So it's interesting. This is all about this guy, Julian English, and this single loss of control sets off a chain of events uh, that include a couple other really, really, really poor decisions on Julian English's part, where he literally sabotages his own life. He makes, he does one stupid thing after another. And he kind of sees that this is stupid. You know, he sees all along the disaster that he's doing to his own life. And it's fascinating. It's riveting. You just sit there and you're just like, oh my goodness, this guy, he gives in to this desire. And when I was reading it, I was sort of reminded of another writer who's very different than John O'Hara, which would be Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe was a guy who sometimes said and did things uh, that he knew were stupid and would really mess up his life. And, you know, he did them anyway. He was a sucker for the imp of the perverse. And I thought of him a bit when I was reading about Julian English, another fellow who drank too much, uh, and just the mess he makes of his life and how he goes about doing it, like I said, it's just, it makes really riveting reading. Because um, you kind of, he's kind of, he's not the best guy in the world, but you feel for him at the same time because he does f seem like a real person and I think there's part of us uh, that can kind of relate to this a bit in that some of us, not me, other people, but some of us, we've kind of done that here and there in our lives where we've succumbed to an impulse that was just disastrous. And we kind of knew as we were coming to this impulse that it was going to be a disastrous thing, but you do it anyway and, you know, the fallout happens. I think a lot of us can kind of relate to that. If only because some of us have had an impulse but didn't succumb to it and we can only imagine what it might have been like if we had. You don't have to imagine here. And you kind of cringe as, as each new terrible thing happens to Julian. And it's really interesting. It's really gripping. It's sad. It, you, there's a lot going on. And there, there's a lot going on with Julian English's character. What drives him to this? What drives him, for example, to cheat on his wife when there doesn't seem to be a lot of reason for it. I guess for that sort of thing, there isn't often a reason for it, but he, what drives him to do that kind of thing? What drives him to do the really stupid stuff that he does in this book? And here we are as the readers just sitting back and just watching the disaster happen. It's fascinating stuff and really well written. I wanna stress that. This guy, John O'Hara, could write. And I don't know that too many people read his books anymore. I mean, some people do, but I, I rarely hear him talked about. Rarely. Uh, this is one of his most famous books, I guess. Uh, I think a lot of his novels are available in Penguin. This is a Penguin Deluxe Edition, which I really like a lot. I actually like this, this cover here. 
really fancy with the flaps and everything. I like these deluxe editions. But as Black Spine Classics, I think you could find his other books. They have a volume of his stories, which, like I said, are great. Uh, I think they're called the New York Stories, although I can, could be wrong on that. I have uh, two volumes from the Library of America of John O'Hara that has his stories and his novels. Great set. Uh, I highly recommend those uh, books from the Library of America. Because this guy, he delivers really, really good writer. Uh, excellent books. I don't know if he's been entirely forgotten. I mean, Penguin did publish this. Uh, but I think he should be talked about and read probably more than he is, uh, John O'Hara. I mean, excellent stuff. And this book, which was published in 1934, an excellent window into the time, uh, a more realistic one than you sometimes find in uh, writings from that time period. Excellent, excellent book. So there you go. That's your Sunday Penguin for today. Appointment in Samara. I will catch you guys tomorrow for another thrilling Mythos Monday. You have a great day. Not quite done yet. A quick addendum. I forgot in that sterling review I just did to explain why the epigraph was there in the beginning. Basically, for those of you who are wondering, the epigraph at the beginning about death and Samara, and that whole thing. Uh, that's there uh, to emphasize the fact that Julian English is doomed. He cannot escape his fate. His fate is, well, his fate is what the, his fate is, which you'll find out if you read this book and you ought to, but he is doomed to his fate. He has an appointment in Samara. And that's what that epigraph at the beginning was, therefore. I meant to say that, but you know, I do these things in one take. I don't always get it right the first time. Okay, guys, I'll catch you tomorrow.